Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Western Governors Association webinar, a toolkit for invasive annual grass management in the West. I'm Bill Whitaker, a policy advisor for the Western Governors Association, just um, starting off with uh, some logistics about the webinar. So as an attendee, everyone who's joined, you are all on mute right now, um, and then uh, our four panelists are, are not muted. The general flow of this webinar is that um, we're going to start with some opening remarks from our um, Jim Ogsbury, the WGA Executive Director, followed by um, presentations by our four panelists, and then some moderated discussion. Um, we are hoping that we'll have some time for questions to the panelists at the end. So um, I would encourage you, as you hear the panelists um, speak, to uh, um, come up with some questions. And there's two ways to submit those. Um, you can submit them um, on the, uh, in the top bar. There's a sort of thought bubble looking um, icon. That's the Q&A button. So you feel free to submit questions to us using that um, using that button. And then on the left-hand side of the panel, there is the attendee chat. And that's a way that you can talk to your fellow attendees and then um, talk to uh, the presenters as well. So we'll be tracking both of those for, um, for questions submitted from the audience. But uh, audience participation is a big part of this, so we encourage you to, um, to take part. So thank you for joining. And with that, I would like to turn things over to Jim Ogsbury, the Western Governors Association Executive Director. Thanks very much, Bill. Uh, with today's webinar, WGA and its partners are introducing a new toolkit for invasive annual grass management in the West. And I'm very proud to be associated with this project, mostly because it reflects a successful and determined effort of Western governors to promote more and better state-federal cooperation. In December 2018, Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue executed the first of several uh, shared stewardship memoranda of understanding with the Western Governors Association. And the idea was to establish a framework for state-federal cooperation in addressing challenges facing Western landscapes. One of the predicates of that agreement was that it needed to represent more than just happy talk in a statement of cooperation. Rather, it had to contain a real commitment to action. To today's webinar keeps the faith of that agreement. Within months of the agreement's execution, WGA and USDA had agreed to pursue three separate and specific joint campaigns pertaining to vegetation management, post-fire recovery, and annual invasive grasses. The toolkit we're introducing speaks to that third campaign, and, and it's a product of exactly the kind of enhanced state-federal collaboration that we had hoped to promote with the MOU. Uh, the toolkit will help state, federal, and local managers address the large-scale infestation of cheatgrass and other invasive annual grasses on western forests and rangelands. Uh, to develop the toolkit, WGA and USDA were assisted by the Western Invasive Species Council, whose 17 members are appointed by governors. Uh, WISC formed an interagency committee to identify best practices and new technologies and innovative management techniques to reduce the spread of, of invasive annual grasses. Uh, members of the committee have worked on this project for over a year. In addition to state and USDA officials, the group included uh, representatives of the U.S. Department of the Interior agencies, uh, counties, conservation groups, industry, and others. Multiple state and federal agencies committed time and resources to this project, and I'd like to extend the governor's gratitude for the efforts of everybody who participated. Uh, the project is an example of the sort of cross-boundary, cross-jurisdictional cooperation needed to tackle some of the West's largest problems. So with that, I'll turn it back to our moderator, WGA Senior Policy Advisor, Bill Whitaker, and a panel of experts who will discuss the toolkit, its contents, and how it can help those working to control the spread of invasive annual grasses in the West. Bill. Thank you, Jim. Um, um, I'd just like to say that I'm really excited about today's webinar, and I'm just really excited about this project. This really brings together a lot of work that's been done um, by WGA, by USDA, and a whole host of other federal partners on invasive species and forest and range management issues. I just feel that there's been a lot of energy about this issue and a lot of interest in what we're doing, and it's really exciting to see it um, actually come to fruition here. Um, as Jim mentioned, there's an interagency committee has been working on this for over a year, meeting in person at con events in conjunction with the WGA Working Lands Roundtable, as well as countless other phone calls and emails. And I would um, like to second Jim and just really extend my thanks to the team that helped develop this toolkit. Um, it took a lot of people coming from a really diverse uh, background and a lot of different agencies to get this done. So um, I'm extremely grateful to all of your efforts. I really particularly want to thank the, um, the team that helped pull 
together the data layer. Um, the folks at NRCS, USGS, BLM, and the University, University of Montana. Um, that was a that was a really uh, heavy lift. That was a really um, uh, thorough effort under under a timeline, and I just really appreciate all the hard work that uh, you did to do that. I was fascinating um, to be a part of this. Um, before we begin, I just want to talk about some of the other events that WGA has going on upcoming in relation um, to inv work on invasive species, but as well um, the WGA USDA MOU. Um, so next Thursday, July 30th, we'll be having another webinar on a, an, um, another campaign coming out of um, the WGA USDA MOU of, of that joint effort. And it's going to be focused on how utilities, states, and federal forestry and wildfire staff are using the federal, federal forestry authorities to the, reduce the risk of wildfire in utility rights of way in the West. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to westgov.org um, forward slash news. That's our news page. Um, and then for fans of WJ's other work on invasive species, um, I'd just like everyone to know that there's a new episode of the WGA podcast out west. Um, there's a new podcast out now, now that explores the steps that states are taking to manage the spread of Asian hornet, also known more popularly, uh, popularly as the murder hornet. So if you'd like to learn about what states are doing to deal with the murder hornet, um, you can also find that at the WJ news page. Um, and then finally, the conversation today is going to focus on the toolkit, um, that new toolkit for invasive annual grass management in the West. And um, that toolkit um, uh, is also um, just released today, can be found a couple places. I'm going to link to, uh, just put a link to it in the our attendee chat. Um, but I'm also going to, uh, you can also find it at the WGA webpage under that news tab. So lots of stuff up going on there. I encourage people to, um, it's just a little bit down on the, the news page, I encourage people to go and read that and follow along and, or um, find it in the attendee chat and follow along. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. Um, we have four panelists today who were um, really central to a lot of this effort, and I'm really grateful to the, the work that they've, been, they've done on this. Um, so we'll be uh, hearing first from Lindy Garner, uh, Sagebrush, Sagebrush Ecosystem Invasive Species Coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, followed by Jeremy Mestis, the Ecologist and National Sagebrush Ecosystem Specialist for USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and then, uh, and then Brian Mueller, the uh, director and associate professor, um, uh, a professor and associate professor at the University of Wyoming Sheridan Research and Extension Center. And then finally, Brian Rutledge, the director of the Sagebrush Ecosystem Initiative at the National Audubon Society. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to um, Lindy. And then a uh, quick, quick note to Brian Rutledge. I know we are, you and I were having some technical issues. I believe that you are on now, so I have muted you, and I'll unmute you when um, the time comes. But I think those technical issues have been resolved. I, I, can, I can hear you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lindy. So Lindy, go ahead. Great, thank you, Bill. And good afternoon to everyone. I just wanna mention again, it was a pleasure to work with this group and we are just a few people speaking for a much larger group. And we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to give just a brief overview of the toolkits elements from the urgent challenge that has us all here today. The path forward our working group felt would help move the needle and the conceptual model for action. I will mention too, there is a slight delay in the movement of slides, so just bear with us a little bit. So the challenge as we all know is specifically that cheatgrass is taking over our sagebrush rangelands in the West. And although not as pervasive or well known, other invasive annual grasses such as Medusa head and Ventanata may be even more problematic if left unchecked and they are increasing as well. These invasive annual grasses are increasing wildfire size and frequency that are threatening our communities, recreational areas, and wildlife habitat. They're reducing forage productivity that increases costs for ranching livelihoods and are stressing our rural economies. The big picture challenge is to maintain core intact perennial dominated sagebrush shrubland and stop this undesired state change to annual grasslands at large scales. So what does this problem look like on the landscape and how big is the problem? Technology has helped us better understand the extent of the problem and how it's changing through time. This map on the left shows the distribution in 1988 compared to 2018 on the right. 
Coverage is designated from low cover in green to high coverage in red. And these winter annual grasses are perfectly adapted for Intermountain West climate and are, and are increasing throughout. This is the brand new data layer that Jeremy will talk more about in a minute, but I want to use it here to show how we use this landscape view based on the relative amount of invasive annual grasses to inform our path forward. When we look at this landscape view, we can see the hotspots of highly invaded in red and the green areas of light to no invasion. You can see much of what we already know. Certain areas in the western portion and Great Basin are significantly invaded by the red, while the eastern portion of the biome does not have as much invasion. But we are starting to see more invasions and areas increasing to moderate levels of yellow and orange. But on both sides across the landscape, there are areas of green or lighter invasion. Yet we have often made decisions of where to place management effort and resources primarily based on a fire perspective of reducing fire risk. So the focus has been on red and orange areas, and rightly so, this is needed to prevent wildfires. But notice how much of the ecosystem is not red, yet. It will be if we don't protect these other areas from further invasion. An invasive perspective would protect the green areas and work to keep the yellow and green areas from turning into new and additional orange and red areas, which would result in more fire risk, more resources needed, and greater management burden. So we wanted to bring more attention to both of these approaches. If we make our decisions only from the fire perspective, we prioritize actions only in areas that are already highly invaded or red and orange for a reactive response. And these areas are costly and potentially less successful at dealing with invasives. But if we also address where to place resources from an invasion perspective, we would include projects in low to mid invasion levels or green and yellow for a proactive response, which is a significant portion of this map and where we can be more successful and cost effective. Just think about this map for a second. If we only focus on the red and orange areas then, then while we are not looking, the green and yellow could continue to change to red and orange, thereby continuing to increase our fire risk and management burden. These areas of green and yellow are core areas that need to be maintained and protected from further invasion spread and can be used as anchors for more management to grow these core areas in a very cost-effective manner and truly move the needle on reducing the invasive threat. And this path forward of more proactive management is supported by invasive plant management principles. As a conservation community, we often wait too long to address resource concerns, deferring management until problems are obvious. Here on the left is a quick reminder of the invasion curve and I apologize, I have an old dog in here. He has trouble breathing every so often. Here on the left is a quick reminder of the invasion curve with low to high density of invasion left to right along the x-axis here at the bottom. Cost of addressing those invasions is on the y-axis on the left. As an invasion starts, management is low cost and can be very effective at eradication and control if you attack the invasion early by being proactive. But as the invasion increases over time, then the management cost increases and we have to turn to a reactive mode of trying to respond with long-term management that is very costly and less likely to be successful. A health analogy is pertinent here, especially in these times. First, we all know prevention is the best policy. Don't get sick in the first place and boost your immune system or in this case, protect intact core areas and don't let invasions in and maintain your native perennial plant communities that are resistant to invasion. But if you do get sick or invaded, address it early so it doesn't grow into a bigger problem. We also know that the landscape context we choose to work in matters a lot. For example, the figure on the right shows two scenarios. The blue proactive approach is where we're managing small problems in an otherwise intact landscape. And the red reactive approach is where we're trying to save small islands in a sea of invasion. 
Which one do you think we're going to be more effective in? So our, our working group highlighted these concepts spatially into a proactive conceptual model. Instead of just always reacting to where cheatgrass is already bad, we want to find those places that are still relatively intact and keep them that way. We know that preventative care is less expensive and more successful than emergency room care. And to do this, we need to first defend the cores of intact habitat from annual grass invasion and anchor our management efforts to these core areas with cost-effective preventative care to reduce the chance of getting flanked. Then grow the core with early and aggressive cost-effective management of annual grass invasions by pushing back the transitioning zone of yellow and orange areas to halt and reverse them from invading into the core areas and prevent regional spread. And then while this toolkit emphasizes the importance of proactive management of intact areas and identifies a preferred direction of action, it acknowledges that continued management of other lands will be needed. And so the third element is to continue to mitigate the most severe impacts of the cheatgrass fire cycle with management in those areas most threatened for life and property, the costly emergency care. So in summary, the challenge of invasive annual grasses is widespread, but we have an opportunity to increase our collaboration and move the needle with more proactive management and implement this model in a spatial context with specific actions. Protect intact and vulnerable sagebrush communities from loss to the invasive grass wildfire cycle <clears throat> by focusing on the conceptual model elements of first prioritize defending the core, by strategically using early detection rapid response efforts and strategies to prevent and eradicate early infestations. Grow the core with aggressive invasive management and restoration to disrupt new invasions and prevent conversion into a more heavily invaded state. And finally, mitigate those heavily invaded areas with fuels management and priority areas to prevent wildfires. And this toolkit provides this roadmap of concepts the data layer, and case studies to help identify how and where we can deploy resources and cost-effective actions across all scales of management, from landscape programmatic planning to regional conversations and coordinated action for cross-boundary management, and can be stepped down by state and local managers by incorporating this information with additional local knowledge and data for management decisions and to identify new management opportunities. So with that said, Jeremy and Brian will share a couple of implementation case studies right after Jeremy first explains the data layer just a bit more. Jeremy? All right, thank you, Lindy. And Bill, can I get the next slide? So this is Jeremy Maestas here with NRCS's West National Technology Support Center. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the data layer, which is part of the toolkit that was produced by the working group, and then transition into a case study, uh, which is another component of the toolkit. So Lindy laid out beautifully the proactive roadmap or the conceptual model. So let's go to the next slide. And what you'll notice about this conceptual thought model is that it's highly spatial. In other words, we need a map in order to have a plan for how we're going to tackle this problem. Again, because what's happening in the neighborhood around you, especially with invasive species management, matters a whole lot. Next slide. The good news is we finally have the data to do this. For years, um, our agencies and partners have invested in that on the ground uh, inventory through national programs like the National uh, Resources Inventory through NRCS, BLM's AIM program, and finally remote sensing satellites that have been up for the last few decades have all been brought together into the spatial products that allow us to do this kind of work now. Next slide. In fact, there's been a flood of innovation and in mapping on rangeland just in the last few years. All of these products can leave managers wondering, well, which one's the best one to use? 
you know, and wouldn't it be nice if we could bring them all together and give a best guess of what's happening on the land? So the work group reached out to uh, some of the largest and uh, most geographically complete um, data developers out there and asked for their assistance on this project. Next slide. And they answered the call. Um, specifically, we enlisted the help of the NRCS and BLM funded rangeland analysis platform, the folks at University of Montana and the USGS who brought together two of their large scale data sets, one from the National Land Cover Database and the other from uh, Harmonized Landsat and Sentinel data that were geographically complete and available over multiple years in the sagebrush biome. And uh, we asked them to work together to help produce an estimate or prediction of uh, annual grass and annual herbaceous cover across the landscape so we can use that in this management proactive management roadmap and you know remote sensing scientists don't often get the spotlight so i really want to specifically acknowledge them here folks like matt jones at university of montana neil pastic uh, matthew riggy bruce wiley stephen boyd colin homer all from usgs and their contracting partners and then of course you heard from lindy she was involved and Michelle Christ at the BLM's National Interagency Fire Center helping to make sure that we tune these products to meet management needs. I, I really laud this group for coming together and uh, producing a data set we can now use um, for a common vision moving forward. Next slide. And that product is a combined data layer that you're looking at here that depicts the percent cover of herbaceous annual plants across the entirety of the sagebrush biome. So it gives you that green to yellow, orange, and red spectrum that Lindy mentioned that helps us from a management standpoint understand the condition of the land relative to annual uh, plant invasion. And now this doesn't just predict um, invasive annuals, it does include native annuals. But on our rangelands, which is where this map is really focused, um, annuals don't make up a very large proportion of that plant cover um, most years. And so if we see persistent annuals from year to year on the landscape, um, we think that's a pretty good surrogate for the extent of our invasive annual grasses in particular in this region. Um, the product, I won't go into all the gory details, but it's essentially a weighted average of those three products we talked about before. And there's um, a methods report you can look up and find out more about how that was done. But essentially, it uh, takes the estimates and puts forth kind of the best guess at what that percent cover value is in that particular location. And the time period of this is a snapshot over the period of 2016 to 2018. We use multiple years because as you know, annuals can fluctuate wildly from year to year. And so we wanted to capture that interannual variability. The resolution, 30 meter uh, pixels. And so think about the inside of a baseball diamond. That's about the size area that we can make predictions on with this type of data. And um, you know that's about a fifth of an acre. So when we summed up all of those 30 meter pixels, one of the patterns that you can visually see on this map is that there's still about 70% of the biome that supports relatively low cover of annuals, providing us with an ample opportunity to implement proactive and early management of invasions before it's too late. Next slide. And we didn't just want to stop with producing a product. We also wanted to make it accessible to people on the ground who can actually do something with it. And so you can interact with the data. If you go to this link um, right now, or as soon as we're done with the webinar um, and visualize the data in a simple web app browser. Um, this doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles, but you can zoom in to local scales and statewide scales to facilitate that planning. Um, and on the left, there's a description uh, with more details on what this product is. 
and you can download the actual data through a USGS science base link um, if you have um, the spatial skills to work with that. Next slide. Now, if you click on any point on this map, you'll get uh, a estimate, especially when you, you have to click on where the mapped area is. So if you click on an area that's not colored up, you'll just get an error. But if you click on the mapped area, you can get that point estimate for that pixel that you clicked on. And it's a prediction of the percent cover of herbaceous annuals during that time frame. Next slide. You can zoom way in to the scale of a pasture or uh, an allotment and actually see patterns of past treatments, um, wildfires. And so this uh, type of information can be useful, um, not only at statewide scales, but at local scales for managers who are following their land treatments. Next slide. And one final feature, if you were to hover over um, the layers uh, button at the very top, uh, the top right, you can see that there's a transparency button that allows you to turn off the layers so you can get some point of reference of where you are on the ground. And of course, it's on the Google uh, Maps template, which allows you to either have an aerial image or a, a map. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide, Bill. I'm going to transition away from that data layer, which is a big lift for this group to produce that product. And I'm going to talk more now about how would you actually use it. And I'm going to rely on telling a story from Idaho. And th this effort just recently launched called the Cheatgrass Challenge, a diverse partnership, um, state-led effort of folks who've come together to implement the very type of strategy that we're talking about. In fact, this provided a lot of the inspiration for the work that's laid out in the WGA toolkit. Next slide. So how does this all work? Um, you know, one thing we were very conscientious of as a work group is not overstepping our, our bounds, um, knowing that a lot of this stuff gets sorted out at state and local levels and that we can't possibly prioritize the landscape like you do. And so we're providing products that have a tremendous amount of flexibility in how you use them. Um, and in Idaho, it really started with this amazing partnership at the state level of all these different groups that have been working together for years. And many of your states have these groups already. These folks came together. Um, our NRCS state conservationist, Curtis Elke, really kind of uh, put out the call and said, who wants to join me in doing something proactive about this? And they, they all sat down, got together in a room, pulled up a lot of the available data and um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And they used the concepts that Lindy had laid out to identify those remaining intact core areas. And by cores, we're talking really big places that are um, reasonably intact. And so uh, they used available uh, annual grass cover data to delineate with those dotted lines. Like where do we start to transition away from an, a big area that's largely intact to an annual grass dominated area, right? And Idaho is kind of ground zero for cheatgrass especially. And so we have this huge area along the Snake River Plain that everybody knows burns every other year. And uh, that really stands out here in those orange and red colors. And so we clearly are defining these um, zones really for different types of management. And the focus of this effort was not sage grouse driven, but of course in the Western US, sage grouse are a priority resource value. And so on top of this map, you can see those sage grouse packs or priority areas for conservation that provide additional points of reference and um, prioritization information. Next slide. They took that map and then they added the arrows. The arrows are the strategy. And that strategy is this concept of defending those core areas first. 
then growing those cores over time, and finally recognizing we need to continue to mitigate the most severe impacts of the cheatgrass fire cycle on life and property where it's already bad. So this is a preferred direction of management when we have a choice. It's not that we're never going to work in the Snake River Plain. That, that's where most of Idaho lives. It's just that our management expectations there are very different than what we might achieve in those green core areas where perhaps we can still prevent um, the worst of the annual invasions from ever occurring. In fact, there are probably localized impacts of other species like Medusa head and Bentonata that could be occurring within those uh, cheatgrass dominated areas that would be worth uh, tackling early. And so Brian Mueller is actually going to talk more about that next, about more narrowly limited and distribution species and how we can apply the same concept to address them as well. Next slide. So that Idaho partnership also uh, recognized that they had to communicate this stuff to broad audiences if they were going to actually enlist their help in implementing it. So if you go to the Idaho NRCS webpage here, you'll see a tile for the Cheap Grass Challenge. It has a ton of resources that other states could beg, borrow, and steal it if they want. Um, there are brochures that lay out, here's the statewide vision, but then how would we actually use that on the ground? What are the types of actions we might implement? Next slide. The partners then went and took this information on the road. And so all of this came together just this spring. They held a series of community meetings with their partners to say, folks, here's the vision. Would you help us implement it? And they really rallied behind the idea. Um, of course, it doesn't hurt when you put some money on the barrel head and say, we're going to incentivize this. In fact, we'd like to see it put forth some proposals of how we would actually do this and where would we do it. And so you, we just had this press release um, from about a month ago where uh, NRCS, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and a whole host of other partners have come together and put their resources towards this common vision of protecting those core areas. So we've got these six uh, large scale project areas where the locals have stepped forward and say, yeah, we see a role for us in this here and we'd like to help. And so this is really where we hope um, the toolkit provides inspiration is, you know, it's a set of ideas, data and examples of it actually being implemented that hopefully will start to be contagious around the West and we end up with a unified, uh, somewhat unified approach across the Western U.S. to tackle this really persistent and, and serious threat. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Brian. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate it. And thanks to Lindy as well. It's great overview of this process that I think uh, has turned out really well and is going to move the conversation forward around invasive grass management in the western U.S. I think it's important to note that the toolkit does not prescribe any specific management actions, uh, but it gives supporting information for planning at regional and local levels. So my goal for the next few minutes is to show some different and relatively specific ways that the toolkit can be integrated with additional information um, to help in some of that decision making process. And I'm primarily going to be working from some examples in the state of Wyoming. I'm going to start with a quick bit of history for some context. In, in 2005, a number of partners formed the Wyoming Cheatgrass Task Force uh, to improve cooperation and enhancement and develop and share information related to cheatgrass impacts ecology and management in Wyoming. And one of their early goals was to develop a good baseline and map to aid in cheatgrass decision making across the state. Remember that, and I'm going to circle back around to that shortly. Another key point is that in 2014, the task force decided to expand the focus to all invasive grasses and broadened our scope to become the Wyoming Invasive Grasses Task Force. Now that decision would also become pretty relevant a few years after that happened 
and I'll share some more on that um, in just a few minutes as well. We've already seen a map like this for Idaho, so I'm not going to go into too much explanation of the details, but I do want to point out that this map that we currently have access to is about as close as it gets to producing that real-time cheatgrass baseline map that was discussed in the formation of the Cheatgrass Task Force in 2005. It's not just cheatgrass, it's all annual cover, but this is what that task force was envisioning at that point in time, and now we've got a much closer representation of that tool. A key characteristic of what you'll see with our Wyoming map is that um, Low invasion, low impact core is a really large proportion of the state, with much of the rest being transitional at risk areas. Now, if we're going to apply the protect the core concept with so much core, it may require further refinement due to logistics and just scale. So I'll show how we might combine additional data with this landscape cover data to identify core areas that may be vulnerable the impacts. So the map we were just looking at now on the left answers the question of where is it now? Where is it primarily focusing on cheatgrass in this case? And the map on the right where darker colors show higher probability of cheatgrass having an impact or becoming dominant on those particular sites answers the question of where is it likely to have an impact? Now the additional map was produced by former graduate student Kara Noseworthy, now Kara Oderwald, by modeling habitat characteristics from points across the state where cheatgrass canopy cover was greater than 50%. We're considering that an impact niche for cheatgrass. Bill, can you advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, when we combine these two, we can identify relatively intact core areas that have environmental characteristics that make them highly susceptible to impact from cheatgrass. So darker colors on the right plus greener colors on the left equals important places to monitor for cheatgrass increase and to impl implement some of those prevention and early intervention management approaches that Lindy talked about. I marked a few of these areas where such is the case that you can see that kind of overlap. These, if these aren't the only areas like that, so don't get upset if your favorite watershed is not included. I would also point out another way that we can potentially use this is to identify areas that may have significant overlap between intact sagebrush, yet also um, a higher invasion state. Now those sites would potentially be at high risk for sagebrush loss due to annual grass-driven wildfires. So managing invasive annual grasses before the fire would be a really proactive way to protect the key habitat component of sagebrush in those transitional areas. So I think that points out that there's a lot of flexibility with these tools. Uh, next slide, please. So the Cheatgrass Task Force changed the Invasive Grasses Task Force in 2014. And then in 2016, self-sustaining populations of both Ventanata and Medusa head were confirmed for the first time in Wyoming. Not good, but we already had a framework in place and cooperations that existed to go ahead and start moving forward with managing those. Next slide, please. So the Wyoming Invasive Grasses Task Force empowered a regional subunit, if you will, which became the Northeast Wyoming Invasive Grasses Working Group to be led by cooperators on developing and implementing a strategy for these two specific new species since they were only known in a relatively restricted part of the state. Now these logos here represent some of the diverse group of partners in the working group. Next slide. It's a great group of people who are implementing the vision of the statewide task force in a locally driven manner and getting a lot of things done, really following the principles that are, that are discussed in the toolkit that we have now. You can go ahead and advance, please. Uh, 
Now, if we go back to our landscape cover map and we overlay the current documented distribution bounds of Medusa Head, which is the purple polygon, and Ventanata, which is a blue polygon, we see a pattern different than if we were looking solely at the aggregate annual cover map. So species identity matters, and, and both Jeremy and Lindy touched on that to some point, especially in cases where we have these problematic species with really limited distributions that may offer us a high opportunity to stop their spread or potentially remove them from the system as a whole. Next slide, please. So in this case, if we employ uh, an early detection rapid response statewide approach, our core that we are attempting to protect from further spread of Medusa head or Ventanata becomes the rest of the state that doesn't yet have these species. And so the purple and blue polygons effectively become our containment zones for these two species in particular, where we want to protect the adjacent non-invaded areas from further invasion and intentionally reduce the abundance of these target species in a strategic way within the containment zones. Now, Medusa head in particular is very restricted in a small portion of the state. I'm gonna to touch on that just a little bit more. I'll say that at least based on our, surve our surveillance efforts and our current known documented distribution. This slide shows some very early work where we're taking a similar approach to what I showed you from cheatgrass using ground mapped presence and absence points to identify suitable habitat. Now the red points on the map to the right are Medusa head presence and the white points are absence. So what we can do is, is pair these approaches together and it will guide future surveillance and enhance our ability to move our monitoring efforts into suitable habitat where we can potentially catch new infestations at their very early stages and make local eradication much more probable. I know this was a, a quick overview. We're trying to save time for questions, but hopefully these examples give you some ideas of how you can combine the core scale toolkit data with local information and I would say expert knowledge to refine your approach for managing annual grasses. I think we need to be aware of perspective and how it affects our management strategies in our areas. I say flip the lens on reactive and proactive. So proactive management may mean preventing new species from further spread in a suitable habitat, or it may mean focusing on desirable habitat characteristics that we want to conserve as the first priority and merging that with understanding risks posed by invasive grasses. And I'll make one last point and then wrap up. Just like our other management tools, this toolkit is no silver bullet or mythical management method. Be skeptical, ground truth, test assumptions, and make sure your decisions are supported by your own experience and hopefully some kind of sound data collection. Follow up monitoring to refine your approach after you implement treatments is the next step in the process so that we can all learn from our successes as well as our failures. So I would just say thanks for your attention. I'm really happy to be a part of this program and I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, as we move into the panel discussion after Brian's comments. Thank you. Bill, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, Brian. All righty. Well, we're going to start the slides, but I'm going to burn through them pretty quickly because there are just a few things I think I really need to cover. We've had a tremendous presentation. Um, folks that have been on top of this for quite a while, and uh, I think we've got three burners on base and somebody's got a back cleanup, so I guess that's my job. Um, let's go to the second slide. The uh, National Audubon Society committed 15 years ago, a little over 15 years ago, to the Sagebrush Ecosystem and its Sagebrush Ecosystem Initiative. And we used sage grouse very much as a model to push things forward in that effort. But we were interested in all the species and the human values that uh, make up that 
landscape. Next slide. Now here, I think it's clear that we should probably have a picture of a UFO since we're failing or facing a, uh, an, an alien invasion. We have to find a way to pull together across all boundaries to make this work together. I'm not going to say collaboration as much as I'm going to talk about cooperation. Next slide. We've got to move on this before we've lost all the basic structure. Being uh, largely a bird guy, I spend a lot of time worrying about where we've lost structure due to these millions of acres of fire. I also worry about the fact that that structure is what anchors snow on the ground in that ecosystem that becomes the water that keeps it alive through the rest of the year. Next slide. Um, this has pushed ag to the brink. The ranchers that I talk to tell me that cheap grass has become a deciding factor as to whether or not they are profitable. Losing that useful feed to this less than useful one is a, a real tragedy. Next. I would suggest that there are multiple economies that can benefit by this effort. And we need to work hard to employ the members of those economies, those who take part in it, both from the guiding aspect to the actual visitors, to take up this cause, to recognize it. And I really call on the NGO community to reach out and make this a reality. Get people to understand just what it is we're up against. Next. Pulling resources together from all of our partners and across boundaries, particularly, making sure that state lines are not a reason why this invader succeeds. Let's work together, bond ourselves to each other to make sure that this core area plan is something that we can push forward together. Without the cooperation we need, we don't succeed in this effort. Next. Partnerships uh, in cooperation and developing restoration technology, looking for money for seed banking, moving towards major federal money to support this through base funding and hopefully through labor in these difficult times when so many are looking for work, it would seem a wonderful time to put people to work in restoring this ecosystem. Next. We have far too much to lose. There's, this is a wonderful ecosystem, deeply underappreciated. Part of our work as NGOs is to make sure it becomes more understood, more appreciated, and better funded. Last slide. We have far too much to lose, not to step forward and take the lead in finding ways to support the great work you've heard described here. These folks cannot do it alone, and nobody right now has the amount of money it will take to pull this together. So it's critical that NGOs work hard on finding legislation to support, writing legislation where necessary, seeking funds, pushing the knowledge that we need across the human community as to the value and wonder of this ecosystem. So again, cooperation, keep the big picture in mind. We can't let this wonderful ecosystem go up in smoke. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to all the um, presenters. I thought that was a great conversation, and I think you did a really great job of detailing um, from, from the origin to the result uh, where we are now. So thank you. Um, and then so we've got uh, 11 minutes left. Uh, we've got time for some questions and answers, and one question I've gotten repeatedly just um, through the chat is, will this be recorded? Yes, it will. Um, so it'll be on the uh, Western Governors Association YouTube page after um, later this afternoon once we, once we put it up. So look for it there. Um, and I'd also just encourage uh, the attendees to um, 
submit your questions through the uh, chat um, function or through the Q&A function. So um, I, before we get to audience questions, I just have a question for the um, everybody, uh, the four panelists involved, Lindy, Brian, Jeremy, and um, Brian uh, Rutledge. It's, you've been involved through this process uh, for a year ago. You and I sort of, uh, all of us sort of started talking about this. What was the most unexpected result that you found from this effort, either from the data layer or the collaboration? What's, what sort of caught you off guard and what are you, what are you um, pleasantly surprised by? It is Jeremy here. I'll tell you, it's shocking to have an unanimous agreement on where we need to go. So when we started talking about, we got to get ahead of this and start being more proactive, there wasn't a single person in the room that said, disagreed with that concept. It's something we all know we need to do. And so, yeah, that uh, I guess was surprising, but also um, empowering because it allowed us to move much faster than would normally be possible. Bill, for me, it's been coming to grips with the expanse of the already existing invasion and the just overwhelming effort it's going to take to drive it back. Brian or Lindy, any, any thoughts? Uh, this is Lindy. I would just agree with Jeremy. The, the overwhelming agreement and just the willingness the excitement of being able to work with the group, whether it was the specifically the technical group or the overall larger group, the willingness of agencies and organizations and private landowners coming in and willing to roll up their sleeve uh, to work together. And like he said, the agreement on the path that needed to be moved forward. And so hopefully uh, this will just help spur additional partners to get back in there and again, look at where we can do the right actions in the right places to uh, expand on this model of getting more proactive management on the ground. Bill, I, I guess I would say um, that was an incredibly diverse group that worked on this and, and, and echo some of the, the surprise at the agreement. Um, but, but I would also say that it feel like there's a little bit of a, of a attitude shift in that instead of everybody throwing up their hands, and uh, and saying that we can't do anything about this problem is that people are are rolling up their sleeves and starting to think you know maybe we can move move things forward and and you go back even even felt a relatively long time ago and people were already giving giving up and so I think that positive attitude and some shared common goals um, maybe is the biggest surprise for me a positive surprise. No, that's good to hear. Um, well, thank you. So an, a question that we've gotten um, from one of the attendees is, uh, how frequently will the data on the data layer be updated to track change in percentage of annual cover? You know, we haven't discussed that as a group, um, but it's entirely possible. Uh, the, the developers that I told you about, they're just constantly innovating and uh, the data sets we have are increasingly available annually. And so, it's, it's possible we could revisit that map at some point in the future. Um, there are the individual products themselves are typically available annually. So I'd encourage you to explore each one of those as well. Great, thank you. I had another question on how ecological restorations had been engaged in, um, to fix this problem. And uh, someone noting that there, you know, there have been um, a lot of agency folks and academics involved, but uh, just a question on how ecological restoration uh, professionals have been engaged on this and just generally how, um, I guess, and I'll add to this question too, and how um, this fits into uh, goals of ecological restoration. Any elaboration on that? I, I'm, I'm not sure the specifics behind the question, um, but, but I would say that a number of the people that were involved in the process do have expertise in ecological restoration and coming at things from reestablishing desirable species and thinking about 
species interactions and appropriate plant materials for those sites that can develop resistant plant communities or at least partially resistant plant communities. And I would say that many of the principles that you see that are reflected in this toolkit are kind of an integration of basic invasive weed management principles and ecological restoration principles at the landscape scale. So I don't, um, I don't know if that's specific enough. Uh, I guess that would be my just off the cuff answer to a question like that. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, here is another question um, about how are practitioners handling their monitoring results? Is there a single repository? If not, is there a need for a single repository? Does anybody want to take a stab at that, or should I? Go for it, Brian. Go for it. Well, that's uh, in, in Wyoming. I can't speak nationwide, so there is not there is not a, a single repository for data mo for monitoring result results, especially post treatment. Um, uh, that has been a an ongoing discussion with uh, Governor Gordon's Invasive Species Initiative in the state of Wyoming is the need for that. Because if you think about uh, the, the learning capacity from collecting monitoring data and actually using those data to refine our processes moving forward, I think there's tremendous capacity to get better at doing this. Um, but a, as of currently, uh, I don't think there, there, there are some nationwide databases for, for distribution and, and uh, severity in some cases for a particular invasive species. But uh, response to treatment, um, I think it's a, it's a need that we have not yet met. And I think there is room to consider that, at least at regional levels, um, if not at a, at a larger level. And I would be open to disagreement from any of my colleagues as well. I would just mention there are some regional groups um, that are working together that may have specific, you know, uh, compilation of monitoring data. But in answer to Dolly's question, it is more of from that broad landscape scale. No. All right. Well, thank you. So here's a question about, um, I think this is probably applied to the um, Jeremy and Brian, the, the, the application of strategies um, and management plans at the state level. So has there been a proactive strategy in place long enough to, sh to point to data showing success in growing core areas, um, be it in the case studies discussed or elsewhere? Or, is, or as a corollary question, will the data be updated? Yeah, I guess uh, I can take a quick stab, but really I, I look to Brian and the efforts in Wyoming. They've been on the leading edge, I would say, for invasive annual grass management in a proactive manner. But here's the deal with annuals. We've kind of given up. They've become so far, especially cheatgrass, so widespread that there's a bit of a sense of hopelessness. And so um, that comes with a cost. There are many, many uh, acres that haven't been affected as badly, and we need to uh, shift our attention to taking care of those lands. So I think this effort's designed to um, maybe do something new and different. Um, yeah, it's it's something we're going to learn from along the way. So we don't have a lot of uh, case examples, but we see states stepping forward like Idaho and Wyoming, especially Oregon's not far behind them. Uh, coming up with their own coordinated strategies and hopefully in um, a few years we'll have examples of that success in uh, halting those those large scale transitions. Any other thoughts? We've got about a minute left. I would just say that it's rather important that we recognize the costs. I brought that up before, but uh, this is something where we're going to need all hands on deck to drive this picture. We've estimated somewhere in the neighborhood of $2.8 billion to basically begin this. So uh, it looks to me like we've got a long ways to hike.
All right. Well, we've, we've made some progress, but we still have a long way to hike. I think that's uh, that's a good way to end it up. I think that sums up where we're at. So um, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to the attendees for joining. Thank you for the panelists for your time. And thank you to um, the, to everybody involved with uh, the work on the toolkit. And thanks to USDA for um, joining with WGA on this project. It's been it's been very interesting. It's very, been very rewarding. So thanks for your time. Um, again, if you uh, there'll be a recording of this posted on the WGA's YouTube page, and then. Um, also, just uh, check out the westgov.org forward slash news, the news site. You can find the data layer. Um, you can find the toolkit. You can find everything that you need there. So, And stay tuned um, for a uh, webinar next week on uh, vegetation management, forestry, and forestry authorities and how vegetation management and wildfire management interact. So um, thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll be in touch.